Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we continue this series of messages entitled Broken Hearts, Break Our Hearts for What Breaks Yours. And the desire is to be able to begin to view the world around us and see it as God sees it. What are the things that create pain and heartache in the heart of God? What are the things that cause God to grieve over his children? And today we're going to look very bluntly at the reality of sin. Not so much individual sins, but sin in general, which encompasses all different kinds of sins, and how that hurts the heart of God. So by way of illustration, I want to share a little bit of history with you. It was October of 1961. Now, those of you who are old enough to have been alive in October of 1961, do you remember what the world was like? You had the Iron Curtain in Russia. The Cold War was in its heat. I mean, Kennedy was president. It was a time of tension. People were building bomb shelters at their homes because we feared the inevitable. Young people today don't even understand that mindset. And right in the midst of this, in October of 1961, the Soviet Union decides to test its brand new bomb, its first thermonuclear warhead. They decided to test it above the Arctic Circle. They got everything ready, and they detonated their bomb, and it was beyond what they could have imagined. I want to tell you what it was like. The flash of the nuclear explosion at the Arctic Circle could be seen for 600 miles. Do you realize how far that is? You could walk out on your porch here in Odessa, Texas, turn to the north, and in Colorado City, 597 miles from here, you would see the light of the explosion. That's how far it could be seen. The wind moved. People could feel it 160 miles away when the explosion happened. For 15 and a quarter miles, nothing was left. I mean, I mean we're talking, talking about evaporated, 15 and a quarter miles. Up to 21 and a half miles, it was damage. And the heat was so intense that third-degree burns were had 60 miles away, and that's where water blisters bubble up on your skin. 60 miles away. All that from a bomb that was 26 feet long and a little bit over 6 foot in diameter. Now granted, 26 feet long and 6 feet around is pretty big, but that's tiny compared to the power that it packed and the devastation that it brought. Today we're going to talk about sin. And so many people have adopted the attitude that sin is no big deal. We've lost sight of the reality that sin packs a powerful punch. God views sin as a monster that will destroy those who embrace it. And yet we live in a society where sin doesn't hardly exist anymore. I mean, think about it. Pick individual sins. Immorality has been downgraded. It's no longer a sin. It's a personal choice, right? Stealing has become a game. You just have to be able to outrun the store security guards, right? I mean, we have come to the point that sin is a kind of a relative term. About the only things in our society that are still taboo is the physical abuse of a woman or a child. I say physical abuse because there are those who are actively working to make sex with children acceptable in society. That's hard to believe, but they're actually doing that. And what we do not realize is the power that sin has in our lives and the destruction that it can bring. Like that bomb that had devastating effects for so great a distance. Sin brings destruction into our lives, and yet we live as if it's no big deal. And we kind of pretend and ignore it. And we don't realize what's coming. The story is told of a man who went to Niagara Falls in the middle of winter. 
Have you ever seen pictures as the, as the water cascades over the falls, there's a lot of ice that forms on the rocks and around and icicles hanging. And because of all the ice, the water doesn't flow over smoothly. It doesn't really at Niagara anyway. It cascades over with a lot of spray because of all the ice. This man watched as birds flocked in. They would fly down into the mist and catch a droplet of water in their, in their beak to get a drink and fly on. And most came and got a few you know, entries into the, into the mist and the spray and got a drink and went on. But some of them, almost it was like a game. They just kept going in to the mist. But what they didn't realize is that it was so cold that every time they went through the mist of the spray coming over the falls, that little ice droplets were forming on their wings. The more they did it, the more ice built up until they went in and there was so much ice they couldn't pull out. And they went over the falls to their own death and destruction. See, that's how sin is. We do it and it's no big deal until we find out that we're overburdened and weighed down with that which used to be fun until it leads to our destruction. The question we have to ask is why is it that God hates sin so much? And what's so bad about it? And we typically live our lives with with the attitude, if I want to do it and it's not hurting anyone, I should be able to do it, right? Why does God hate sin so much? I mean, after all, let's be honest about it. Sin is fun. You agree with me on that? Sin is fun? Would you do it if every time you sin, somebody slapped you upside the head? Like training your dog not to get on the counter? Every time you sin, you got slapped upside the head? Would you then learn not to sin? Probably. But why do you choose to sin? Because it feels good. If it didn't feel good, I wouldn't do it. And because sin feels good, because we like it, we keep doing it. Even though, in the back of our mind, we know it's dangerous. Now, some sins we're talking about are obvious. We used to be told all the time, don't do drugs. You do drugs, they'll kill you. Do you hear that message anymore? Do you ever hear the message that drugs are dangerous? Now, we give drug addicts a safe haven, a place to go and do their drugs where they won't be disturbed. And we provide needles. The government gives them clean needles because God forbid our druggies get hepatitis or AIDS while they're shooting up. It's fun to steal and get something for free. And who cares if I drink too much or smoke a little weed? It's not hurting anybody. And if it's not hurting anybody and I want to do it, I should be allowed to do it. See, the challenge is we generally accept this idea that it's okay if it doesn't hurt anybody, but what we forget is that we're hurting ourselves. And we don't understand that until it's too late. Like the little birds with the droplets of water that are turning to ice, it's fun, it's fun, it's fun, until all of a sudden we're weighed down and overcome. And when we've lost what matters most to us, we realize how bad it was. But it's too late. You say sin has its consequences. And yet we play games with sin. We try to justify them. Some of you have probably heard of St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, a great theologian, a great writer. And a lot of what he wrote and how, what he clarified about the Word of God has come down to us as solid teachings. But he didn't start out as an on-fire Christian. He grew up in a pagan world. And when he first became a Christian, he didn't quite grasp how bad sin was. And so as he, he talks later about his journey of faith, and he, he started praying a prayer, God, make me good, but not yet. In other words, there's lots of things in my life I want to do, so God, I want to belong to you, I want to be good, I want to be holy, I want to be righteous, but not yet. Kind of like the person that says, yeah, I used to go to church when I was a kid, and someday I'll get back to church, but there's a whole lot I want to do before I go get back to church, so I'll, I'll put that off to another time. God, make me good, but not yet. 
They're just banking that they've got enough time. And Augustine, as he suffered the reality of sin in his life, finally changed his prayer to, to God, make me good, but not entirely. God, there, there's certain things I can give up. Yes, there's things I know that are wrong. I can give them up. But this thing right here, this vice that I've got, this sin that I love so much, God, I can't live without this. I have to have this. So make me good, but not completely. Let me have this little private sin. And after he suffered enough pain in his life because of his own sinfulness, Augustine finally came to the point where he said, God, make me good. God, help me to understand what it means to belong to you. God, help me rid my life of sin completely. God, make me good. So, what I'm going to do now, all that's been my way of introduction. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to outline six reasons why God hates sin. Six reasons why sin grieves the heart of God. And if you are a child of God and you belong to God, then when we get done with these six reasons, your heart should be feeling the grief that God's heart feels in regards to sin. And 10 minutes from now, if your heart is not feeling the weight of sin, then you need a faith check. You need to look in the mirror and ask yourself honestly, do I really love God most in my life? Because if I did, my sin would grieve me. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through these, because we need to understand why sin hurts the heart of God. Reason number one, God hates sin because it's the very opposite of his nature. Listen to what David said. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. Sin is the opposite of God. God is, we are told all through Scripture that God is holy. In fact, when Isaiah has his vision of God exalted on his throne and the train of his garment flowing out and filling the earth, the seraphim, the angels are flying around the throne of God proclaiming, holy, 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 because God is pure and holy. God is the essence of holiness and purity, and sin is the opposite of God. And because it is the opposite of who he is, he has a disdain and a disgust of sin. It's, it's ugly to him, and he's angered by it. In fact, sin is described as putrefying sores. That's infected flesh that's rotting and stinking. Putrefying sores, a heavy burden, defiling filth, a binding debt, absolute darkness, an ugly stain. It's the opposite of God. God is absolute purity, absolute beauty, beauty, clean, and sin is the opposite. And God despises that which is sinful. So do you understand what that means? When Jesus went to the cross, what did he do? What was the cross all about? Our sin becoming his? Our sin coming into him and him being a sinful human being? Not just sin of one person, but the sin of all people, putrefying sores, rotting stench. Jesus on the cross became so undesirable that God said, I can't. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me is the cry of agony of a son who's been abandoned by his father because the father can no longer look upon the son because the son is ugly with sin. God hates sin because it's the opposite of who he is. And Jesus paid the price for that. Number two. God hates sin for the simple reason that sin separates us from him. Do you understand that? Isaiah wrote, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. 
It was sin that caused Adam and Eve to run away from God and hide from Him. Can you imagine walking into your home and your little children screaming, oh, run and hide, and running away and hiding because they were scared of you? I guess that happens in some families. But God comes into the garden and Adam and Eve run and hide because they're sinful and they know they can't go to Him. God hates sin because He wants us. He wants us to be able to come to Him. He wants to be able to hold us and love us, but our sin puts a wedge and a separation between us and God, and that grieves the heart of God. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why with the kids, why when we were started out in God's mind and desire to be pure and clean and holy, and sin became a reality, and we were putrid and ugly, that Jesus shed his blood for us. So his blood, having been applied to us, his blood washing over us would make us clean, pure, holy, and acceptable in the sight of the Father. So the Father could come to us now and embrace us and tell us how joyful he is and how thankful he is that we now belong to him again. Jesus going to the cross makes it possible for God the Father to celebrate us as his children. Sin kept that from happening. Number three, God hates sin because it entices us to focus on worldly pleasures and not God's blessings. You understand that? We focus on worldly pleasures and not the blessings that God has given to us when sin is the focus. See, God desires to bless his children. God wants to bless you. And there's no blessing he will withhold from you. But sin gets in the way. Sin shortcuts the blessings of God because we're not focused on the blessings, we're focused on ourselves. So let me give you an example. What happens, well, you just pick on men. What happens when a man is married, but everything's more important than his wife? Going out, running around, having a good time with his friends, drinking and partying, and his wife's sitting home alone. Or he gets wrapped up in, in porn and maybe he's got a girlfriend on the side. What happens to his wife? She's pushed to the back burner. And yet God has given a man a wife, given you a spouse, as the greatest gift in your life, second only to your own salvation. And your wife is suffering because you're focused on sin. You know why that is? Because sin is selfish. Your children will suffer because of your sin. Well, you can't say that. I love my kids. I do anything for my kids. Yeah? Really? When you're wrapped up in sin, who are you looking at? Myself. I want what I want, and I want it now. And I'm looking right here at what I want, and I'm oblivious to everything and everyone else. And I'm going to get what I want because it's what I want. My flesh craves it. I love my sin. I won't give it up. And because it is focused here in what I want, I don't see anything else. Not my spouse, not my kids, not my boss, not my friends, nothing. Nothing matters but what I want. I'm blind to everything else. But you know what? Kind of like Augustine, when you finally get to the point when you've suffered enough and you say, God, make me good. God, help me understand how bad sin is. And you lift your eyes off of yourself to the holiness of God and to the life he's called you to. All of a sudden, looking out there at God, you see everything else he's provided. You see your spouse, your kids, your friends, your job. You see everything he's given you to be a blessing in your life that you were oblivious to because you were only focused on yourself in the selfishness of your sin. See, God wants to bless you, but your sin keeps you focused on yourself and oblivious to the blessings that God has given you. But when you understand how much sin hurts and you look to Jesus, you look to God, all of a sudden you see everything he's done and everything he's provided and how blessed you truly are. Number four, another reason that God hates sin it blinds you to the truth. Jesus said this. He said of false teachers, blind guides who lead the blind and both fall into a pit. John said, the one who hates his brother does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. 
Sin has consequences which we often ignore and disregard. We know if we do bad things, there are going to be bad consequences. We know that. But we just pretend like we can get by with it and it's not going to happen. God says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, he will also reap. God hates sin for the same reason that light hates darkness or that truth hates a lie because it leads us astray and we suffer. What is it God wants for his children? What does he want for us? Listen to what Paul wrote. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding. Do you, reason that, do you understand that God wants to give you everything? There's nothing he will withhold from you. But sin gets in the way. Number five, God hates sin because it enslaves us and eventually destroys us. Do you remember Samson? A child of promise? Miraculous conception. Chosen by God, set apart and devoted to God from birth. Called by God, used by God to accomplish great things. How did his life end? They gouged out his eyes, chained him to a millstone, and made him grind grain. Why? Because his sin. He could not get over the fact, oh, there's a pretty lady, I want her. There's another one, I want her. His immorality led him astray from God and got him in trouble. Remember Delilah? He could not let her go. He could not stop being consumed by his sinful desires. And it blinded him and bound him and led to his death and destruction. Hear this. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are a slave to the one whom you obey, either to sin, which leads to death, or obedience that leads to righteousness? Understand, sin is addictive. Not just drugs and alcohol, that have the chemical addiction. All sin is addictive. I guarantee you, if you know, have ever known of anyone who was a thief, or anyone who's wrapped up in pornography, or anyone who was on a power trip, okay, pick one, it's never enough. I need more. I need more to get the thrill. I stole something, that's great, but I need to steal again to get that same thrill. But it's not quite the same. I need more, something bigger, something, a bigger challenge. Porn, this little bit's not going to do it. I need more and more and more. It needs to be more and more graphic. Power, I need to control not just you. I need to control all you. I need, it's got to be more because it's addictive. And this addiction of sin consumes the life of a person. And sin is a barrier to the life that God wants us to have. We get consumed and addicted to the sin or missing what God has provided. God created us to live, to have life to the fullest, and sin is robbing us of that life and leaving us an empty shell of what we're supposed to be. Number six, God hates sin because it lessens our love for him. I said before, sin is selfishness. When we're wrapped up in sin, our focus is on ourselves and not God. John wrote, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And James wrote this, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. To embrace the world is to turn your back on God. And it's because God loves us, because God wants us, that it grieves his heart when his people choose sin over him. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. No one can serve two masters. You'll be obedient to one or a slave to one. Jesus did not die on the cross so we could wallow in the muck and the mire of our sinfulness. 
Jesus died on the cross to win forgiveness, to clean us, to make us pure, to restore true life to us where we could experience all that God wants us to have in this life as we look forward to the life to come. Believers, as believers, we should hate what God hates. We should grieve what grieves the heart of God. God wants us to understand who we are. He wants you to understand who you are. We talk about Jesus going to the cross, and it's, you know, like, it's almost too big to think about. But do you understand that it was your sin that he bore on the cross? That he was putrid and ugly because of you? You think, well, I haven't done anything that bad. How much sin does it take to become a sinner? One. And you're ugly and unacceptable And Jesus became that for you so that you could be declared clean, could be made innocent, could be from God's perspective one who is acceptable because the blood of Christ has made you holy. And it's not about anything you could do for yourself. He did it for you because he loves you. And it's his love for you that is so intense that he says, you belong to me. I want you, and it grieves his heart when we turn from his love to sin. So it is my prayer for myself as well as for you that we would truly learn what it means to grieve for the things that grieve the heart of God. They would see this world honestly and grieve for those who are trapped in sin. And that we would stand in front of the mirror and look at ourselves and truly grieve the sin in our own lives. And finally come to a point where we can say, Lord, make me good, but not yet? No. Lord, make me good, but not completely? No. Lord, make me good. Help me to be like Jesus. And in that, we will begin to feel in our own hearts a passionate love for God, the same passionate love for him that fills his heart with love for us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord and the life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.